I'm really excited for the conversation that we're going to happen. We're going to have today with a good friend of mine, Chris Bush. Uh, Chris and I actually attended Vanderbilt University together, and after graduation, Chris went on to get a high-paying job with a reputable tech company. Some of you may have something similar, some kind of similar experience with that. Um, and Chris did really well at this job. He got promoted, and he got paid more, and he got more responsibilities, and he got fancier titles. And then one day he woke up and he just wasn't happy. He had become what he calls a depressed workaholic. Um, and so that led Chris to leave that cushy tech company job and go explore happiness around the world. He went on a, a year-long world tour to understand and, and speak with happiness experts, understand what makes people happy, what is, is it possible to be happy and successful at the same time. Um, and he's here to share some of those tips with us today. He's an award-winning speaker and best-selling author uh, and a good friend of mine. And uh, please help me welcome to the stage, Chris Bush. So Chris, um, let's start with, with just a bit of your background and tell us about yourself and how you became a globetrotting happiness expert. Sure. Well, first of all, so thrilled to be here. You're in with some of the smartest people in the world. I also know that you're also some of the busiest people in the world, so thank you for taking the time off to chat with me. So my background. So when I was 16 years old, I already knew exactly what happiness was. And that was my crush, Paige, going out with me. <laughs> yeah, right from prom. If you're wondering, I did take the Duke hat off before I went to prom. And that was happiness for me. If Paige will go out with me, I'll be happy forever. Well, she did, and shockingly, I wasn't happy forever. I was happy for about a month. Because <laughs> that's about when we broke up. <laughs> that wasn't quite happiness. I'll be happy when I get straight A's. So I got straight A's, and guess what? It didn't really make me that happy. So I thought, all right, I know, I know now. I'll be happy when I get into Vanderbilt. So I got into Vanderbilt, freshman year came, and the happiness high subsided. I thought, okay, getting ready for adult world. I'll be happy when I get a high paying job. So I got a high paying IT job. And a year into my work, I was sitting at my desk, still not feeling very happy or fulfilled. And I was running out of ideas. I started brainstorming. What's at the end of the sentence? I'll be happy when, I'll be happy when. And I got, I finally figured it out. I thought, I'll be happy when I have a fast car, make six figures, and have a girlfriend who plays Super Smash Brothers with me. <laughs> and a six pack. <laughs> I got most of those, and I still wasn't happy. And then I started to feel a little desperate. I was running out of ideas. So I settled on the idea that I'll be happy when I make enough money. Well, I made enough money, I still didn't work. And um, one day I was sitting at my desk at work, and I got an email from my mom. That was addressed to me, Chris, and Greg. Well, Chris and Greg are also my uncle's names. And the email said, let's not tell the grandkids yet, but dad's dying. And in response to the news that my grandfather, my childhood hero, was dying, I thought he was in perfect health, I felt absolutely nothing. And that's when I knew something was seriously wrong. So I went to check in to, to talk to uh, therapists the, uh, my mental health squad, as I call them. And eventually I was prescribed some antidepressants. And shortly after being told, I was depressed. And these pills helped me go from negative five to zero, but I thought, that's not good enough. That's not good enough for me. That's not good enough for every young person who's been in this situation, wondering what happiness is, wondering how to beat stress, anxiety, and depression. Going from zero, negative five to zero isn't good enough. How do we go from zero to 10? And that question has been driving me ever since. That was about four years ago. So at that point, I had a crossroads in my life. I had a promotion offer on my desk. 
but I thought I can help the world more if I try to answer this question. Now, I'm not saying you should quit your job, even though that's what I did. I don't want Sundar to come here in a helicopter. <laughs> I'm not saying quit your job. I'm saying I did because I wanted to find out this answer and tell everyone else so you guys didn't have to. And that's what brings me here. I then went on a globetrotting tour. I went to about 31 and change countries, just asking people on the street, anyone I could who'd have a conversation about with me in English, uh, what does it mean to be happy? And that's what brings me here. So I want to I want to get into your method and kind of what you prescribe in, in this book and your your thoughts on how we can all um, achieve our own happiness. Because uh, we've hosted other happiness experts in the past. We've, we've had Sean Aker and Mocha Dot and, and uh, of course, Jay McFenn, who created the Search Inside Yourself program yeah, that yeah. many of our, our own Googlers have attended. So talk to us about your approach and what makes it unique. So my approach to happiness completely changed by the time I reached the Taj Mahal. I remember that day I was in a terrible mood. I couldn't figure out why. I was just crabby, and I was trying to ruin everyone else's mood, my friend group. <laughs> So, right, happiness expert, right? <laughs> so I go up to my Australian friend, Helen, and she, she sees the Taj, and she just lights up. She looks like a little kid who's just discovered what Halloween is. She's like, oh my god, is that real? Look, it's good accent. It is so special. I've never seen anything like it in my life. And I go over to her, and I'm like, no, he, um, he built that for his dead wife. You know that, right? <laughs> While he had other wives, and they had to watch him build that for me, his favorite. How do you think they felt? <laughs> and she turns to me, yeah, I was speaking to jerk. So she turns to me and she's like, completely unfazed. She's like, ah, come on, mate. I bet you a thousand rupee you're just in a bad mood because you're dehydrated. <laughs> <laughs> what? So sure enough, I take a huge swig of water like I need to right now. And I feel instantly better. It just kills my bad mood. And she's like, eh, hey, isn't that better? <laughs> and I, I keep getting this feeling in my travels, like Australians already know everything about happiness. <laughs> like they, they look at America and they think we're like the muggles of happiness. Like, Keep it a secret, they don't know yet. Give them some time. <laughs> so after that moment, when I realized that happiness can be within our grasp if we just do a few things right, up until that point in my journey, I let my inner hippie make all the decisions. Yeah, man, you should like go to a drum circle and study happiness. Yeah. Well, I fired that guy, and I let my inner German take over. <laughs> That's my background, I'm German. So he's like, lights. You should now study. It's the most efficient way to be happy in this world. <laughs> Look at that, it's a Porsche. Porsche 911 is a perfect car. It should make the perfect happiness formula. It's from church and so else. So that was when my whole philosophy on happiness shifted. Instead of these ethereal 10,000 foot ideas, I wanted to find the short term, instant uh, happiness fixes, happiness hacks, as I like to call them. Let's go into those happiness hacks. Uh, what are some of the ways that we can increase our long term happiness? in what you call just a few minutes? Yeah, so there are two types of happiness in the world. There's what I call true happiness, which is the lasting, nourishing happiness. And then there's pleasure, which is the short-term fix, right? So my favorite form of pleasure is a soda. And a soda will make you feel good for about five minutes, followed by a pinch of regret. <laughs> and it's not really, you can't build a lifetime just drinking a happy life drinking a soda. That's a pleasure. <laughs> Whereas true happiness is a different form entirely. So true happiness is something that will, you can do in the instant, but it'll last and have a slow burning effect on your happiness. So a challenge I had with these instant happiness uh, fixes, or the happiness hacks as I like to call them, is sometimes I would prescribe one and someone would say, well, I don't feel like doing that right now at all. Like um, somebody had a really bad day Let's say here they do. You're exhausted. You're getting home at nine o'clock. You're like, I'm just, I'm just exhausted. I can't deal with this right now. And your roommate goes, Well, just, just be grateful. Just be grateful. You work at Google. Just be grateful. <laughs> right. That doesn't make you instantly happy. So I divided happiness into two different levels, and these are all forms of true happiness, as I like to call them. So. Level one is an acronym I call MESH. MESH is the baseline of things you need to do 
on a daily or every few days basis to, to maintain kind of a baseline concrete foundation of happiness. So MESH stands for meditation, exercise, sleep, and hydration. So anytime in my journeys or if I'm getting ready for a speaking gig, I just don't feel very happy and I can't pinpoint why that is. I go and do my mesh. I say, okay, I meditated this morning, I exercised, I got five hours of sleep last night. That's where I goofed up. And I found if I can consistently do mesh throughout my life, I'll have this higher level of baseline happiness. What positive psychologists would call your hedonic set point. So just by doing mesh, you can keep your hedonic set point a little higher than it might be right now. So that's what I call the level one of true happiness. Level two are the more advanced stuff that you can do once you have your baseline taken care of. My acronym for level two is GRIP. That's gratitude, relationships, intellect, and passion. So once you have your base needs taken care of, it's easier to be a bit more grateful. So for me, for gratitude, for example, when I was growing up, as I mentioned, I kept saying things like, I'll be happy when. I'll be happy when I get to Vanderbilt. When I work at Google, I'll be happy. When I'm traveling the world, I'm asking these people who have staggering amounts of happiness, rickshaw drivers, you know, janitors, it's unbelievable. They started sentences a different way. Instead of, I'll be happy when, they started sentences with, I'm happy because. I will never forget a rickshaw driver I was riding with. Um, actually, this is a longer story, because he had a lot of, this guy had a lot of wisdom. So I got a picture of him. There's, that's well, me in Bhutan. Here, we'll just go through my travel slideshow. <laughs> <laughs> that's me in Bhutan. That's uh, India. That's Sarnath, the site of Buddha's first teaching. I was meditating until these uh, Indian eighth graders came and surrounded me. <laughs> that's Sweden. So I was asked by the Swedish to come to Sweden and teach them about happiness. For those of you who don't know, Sweden's one of the happiest countries in the world. So I said, that's like Michael Phelps asking for swimming lessons. <laughs> I, should, I should go to Sweden, y'all should teach me. We did a little bit of uh, happiness in both directions. Oh yeah, so <clears throat> I visited a Buddhist monastery or just to learn mindfulness meditation, I check into one. It turns out they run some Buddhist monasteries just like Airbnbs. <laughs> you just hit them up by email and say, I'd like to stay for 12 days. And they might charge you, you know, 40 bucks a day, but that'll cover your meals and expenses. So I scheduled some time to visit this Buddhist monastery in Mississippi. <laughs> 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 because when you think the epicenter of Vietnamese Buddhist thought. <laughs> you go to Mississippi. So that's what I did. So I'm at Magnolia Grove, and imagine you're about to walk into a Buddhist monastery. What kind of things would you see? What kind of things would you smell? What would you expect the monks to be doing? Maybe meditating, cleaning, or like dragging that break through the sand or whatever they do? None of that. So I walk in, and this monk hands me a margarita. <laughs> I said, is this a margarita? He said, no, it's a, and does anyone have any guesses? It sounds like margarita, but it starts with a B. If you can guess it, it'll give you a free book. Beerita. Beerita, not, no, not quite. We're at a Buddhist monastery. Buddha Rita. yeah, so they have me a Buddha Rita. So walk in, it's Buddharita, they're doing, uh, they're watching a Bollywood movie, and they're doing karaoke in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out, even Vietnamese devout Buddhist monks will take what they call a lazy week, where they just have a staycation and hang out. So I, sh I showed up in the middle of lazy week, and I'm doing, within 20 minutes, I'm doing uh, karaoke in a language I don't speak. But later that week, I actually learned mindfulness meditation and got back into the rhythm of things. So, after that long diversion, here we are. So that's Sati. <laughs> Sati was the most memorable person I spoke to in my entire journey in 31 countries. I get in Sati's rickshaw, and uh, a little outside the Taj Mahal, and I say, Sati, I'm a student of happiness. I'm traveling the world to ask people what happiness means. 
so what does happiness mean to you? And he lights up. Like he's instantly got the answer. And he goes, ah, happiness, my friend. Happiness, there are two secrets to happiness. First is that happiness is love. Too many people in this world wait around to receive love. What we forget as a species is that we can give love. Sometimes in the middle of the day, I still feel depressed. So what I'll do is I'll drive down to the Mother Teresa house in the Ganges River, and I'll pour soup into the mouths of those less fortunate than me, and I'll create love. And as long as I can create love, I'll be the happiest man in the world. I said, Sati, that's beautiful. But you said there are two secrets to happiness. What's the other one? I said, ah, you need to find a hot wife. <laughs> so, see, we were doing so well. So, what else is there? So, well, gratitude is also important. He said, I'm happy because I can feed my family tonight. I'm happy because I have a job. I'm happy because I have unlimited love in my life. So a very easy gratitude hack is rather than start a sentence with I'm grateful for, which for me personally doesn't really work that well, I ask myself, I'm happy because. And I'll answer that every day. And it's okay if the answers are the same every day because you can remind yourself why you're already happy. So instead of I'll be happy when and setting a goal for that you'll never reach, I'll be happy when, I'll be happy when, Remind yourself why you're already happy. I'm happy because. Let's talk about the, the other part of that acronym. Um, you mentioned relationships. Talk to us about how you maintain relationships. I think a lot of folks, you know, especially the millennial crowd, they've graduated from college in the last you know, four or five years. Um, they're now in their first job, maybe mid to late 20s. And I think a lot of folks find a sense of sadness because they don't you know, a lot of the relationships that they had when they were younger kind of start to fade away and people grow, grow apart. Talk to, talk to us about your relationships and how you maintain those. Yeah, absolutely. So this was definitely a day when I was not traveling. I was back home in Atlanta, just me in front of a laptop, uh, doing happiness research, like full German. But it should find the most efficient way to be happy today. That was on my to-do list, find efficient happiness. So there's a TED talk about it. There's a study called the Harvard Grant Study. Has anyone heard of this before? Yeah, a couple of hands. So the Harvard Grant Study is, in the 1930s, Harvard researchers decided to start collecting millions of data points from hundreds of Bostonian men, Harvard grads, or Harvard undergrads, but also uh, men from underprivileged neighborhoods. They didn't really have a strong objective back then. They just wanted to collect a ton of data that they could then extrapolate, uh, extrapolate ideas from later in, in the century. So in 2013, 75 years after the inception of the study, a guy named Robert Waldinger did a TED talk revealing what they found after 75 years, the number one indicator of a happy, healthy life. Like the one thing that kept these guys happier and living longer and more successful throughout their entire lives. And that one thing was their relationships. And not the quantity of the relationships, but the quality. So these guys, one thing that the happiest guys in the grant study all had in common is they had five close friends. And I took that idea and I ran with it. And it turns out the happiest societies in the world generally all have some format of that five good friend rule. So Okinawa, for example, Okinawa is what they call a blue zone, a UN designated area where they have a unique amount of centenarians, people who live past 100. So, Sociologists around the world love to study blue zones because you can extrapolate the secrets of long life and happiness. And one of the secrets of the Okinawan society is that they have what they call a moai, M-O-A-I. I think that's right, yeah, M-O-A-I. So the moai is when Okinawans are born, their families find them five close friends that they'll have throughout their entire life. And you'll see pictures of Okinawans and their moais over 100 years after they were created. I think 
as a society, we've lost touch of the quality of relationship because there are websites that I will not name <laughs> that tend to value quantity over quality. When I hold back my networking and trying to meet a million people in the world, instead pool my resources into growing five chosen relationships, my happiness skyrocketed. So that all being said, here's a very simple tool for, as David said, reconnecting with somebody, maybe your best friend in college who you haven't spoken to in years. <clears throat> Facebook, one thing I love about Facebook is that it tells you when your friend's birthdays are. And one thing I love to do every day is call that person. I pick up the phone and I call them and just have a quick conversation. Sometimes I'll leave a voicemail and I sing them happy birthday. <laughs> But think about, imagine it's your birthday today, and a hundred people write on your Facebook wall, happy birthday. But one guy even wrote HB on my thing. <laughs> wow, thanks. <laughs> HB? I can tell you really put a lot of thought in that. <laughs> so don't write HB. Imagine a hundred people wrote HB on your wall, and one person called you, wish you happy birthday, and call and, and catch up. It makes so much difference. And what did that cost you to pick up the phone? What did that cost them to make the call? Five minutes? Five minutes to reignite a relationship? That's how I reconnected with David. I don't think I called you on your birthday, but I just called you. <laughs> and around that time. And um, because of because I reignited a relationship that I cared about, here I am. Here we are. Here we are. I think MySpace was closed with the top eight, but I guess we're talking the top five friends, which we should consider. Um, we're going to go to audience questions here in a little bit, so so consider those, and we'll get the, the mic set up. Um, I'm sure you have some some more crazy travel stories from your time. Uh, Tom brought. Do you have any you want to share? Let's see. Oh, there's this time in Cozumel. <clears throat> I love talking to cabbies. Cabbies, rickshaw drivers, generally. They're sort of undercover sociologists and psychologists because who else listens to somebody else's life story every single day? Uh, these people have so many conversations. They're generally buckets of wisdom. And I love talking to these guys. So I got in a cab in Cozumel and I said, the usual, hey Miguel, I'm studying happiness. I love asking people what makes them happy. And he cuts me off and he goes, I will take you to where they make happiness. <laughs> what does that mean? And he doesn't ask me where I'm going or where I want to go. You know, his job as a cab driver. Instead, he just drives me to where they make happiness. So I'm in Cosmo. Does anyone have a guess where they would make happiness? It begins with a T. Yeah, it's just a tequila farm. He drove me to his cousin's tequila farm. <laughs> he pulls out this little, I watched the whole process. It's actually pretty fascinating. So at the very end of the process, tequila is dribbling down the sugar chute. It's capturing the perfect amount of sugar. And it just drips into this little Dixie cup. And he, he hands me his Dixie cup and he goes, my friend, your journey is over. <laughs> That's a wrap. All right, right home, I get home. <laughs> um, all right, we're going to go to audience questions here when just start lining up at the mic. Um, and in the meantime, I want to go back to grip. Um, so we talked about gratitude, we talked about relationships. Talk to us about the last two in the acronym. Yeah, yeah, intellect and passions. Those are, those are challenging ones. So for intellect, what I like to do is set a Google alert <laughs> on, on my favorite topics, that might be uh, happiness, positive psychology. Um, I also love cars, so Porsche. And I'll just like Google email me the latest articles on those topics, and then all of a sudden I've got a pile of reading material for if I'm on the subway or if I'm in an Uber or whatever, so I'm constantly sharpening my intellect. Personally, I'm also a big fan of the, I know they're a bit controversial, but the apps that you can play uh, brain training games on. Uh, 
they've been in and out of the news because they've made some marketing claims that may or may not have backing, but personally I've found that they actually work and keep my brain sharp. And here's a really kind of a quirky one I've been doing lately, and I welcome your judgmental stares. <laughs> I was uh, tutoring my neighbor's son and getting him ready for SSAT. And he didn't have the answer key around. So as an adult, I just had to go through the SSAT practice, practice questions and just answer them myself. And I realized that the questions designed to challenge elementary and middle schoolers are actually pretty good for jostling different parts of the brain, like the preformal cortex, insular cortex, et cetera, for an adult. So sometimes before a gig or for trying to jog my creativity, I will download an SSAT practice test off the internet <laughs> and just take it. So that's intellect. <laughs> Do three of those and you'll be the smartest person in the world. Chris, um, you brought your book with us today. Talk to us about the, the experience publishing your own book mm -hmm. um, and what folks who read it can, can uh, expect to get out from reading that. Sure. So. I drafted the book in Microsoft Word, and I just had it sitting in this document and wondered, what are my next options, right? Traditionally, you can self-publish, which means you send it to Amazon or whoever, and they'll send you back your book, and it books in a box. You can go through traditional publishing, where you get an agent, then you itch it around, and, you're, and you might get a bite from a major or a small boutique publishing house, and, they may or may not take some creative control. It might be three months or three years. And I thought, I don't like the idea of self-publishing. Um, it doesn't feel really like a, I'd be joining the industry if I just self-published. I also don't feel like I want to lose any creative control. So there's a third option now called hybrid publishing, where you work with a boutique publisher, but if you pay some of the costs up front, they'll let you retain higher royalties and creative control. That's exactly what I did with a small company called BookLogix in uh, Alpharetta, Georgia. So they're my formal publisher. They're listed as my publisher with a little B on the book. Um, what that let me do is retain creative control. And yeah, we went from books sitting in a Word document to edited, critiqued, and books in hand in about four or five months. And that's pretty, that can be pretty intensive. I don't know if you work full time at Google, you'll have time to do that in four months. But know that it's possible. If you have a book thinking around in your head, know that it's never been easier to publish your own work, your own book. So after that, I had, I wanted to galvanize all of my friends and family into supporting the book. The traditional school of thought is to launch on Amazon, but I wanted to do something a bit more fun and gamify it. So I ran a Kickstarter campaign to fund the book and all of my upfront self-publishing costs. So a thing I love about Kickstarter is you get a ping on your phone every time somebody donates. So I was connecting with some of my old teachers, my old English high school teacher. So yeah, I'm running this online fundraiser to publish my first book. Ah, oh, that sounds pretty cool. I get back to my car and I get a ping on my phone. This is Finch donated $120 to your Kickstarter. And that's an isolated case, but if you run your own Kickstarter campaign, or whichever fundraising platform you choose, and you put your own creative creation on the line, and you see people from your past life, from your current boss, your best friend, and his best friend, pouring money to help you give birth to something that you care about, something that you've put your heart and soul into, it was the most amazing, humbling experience of my entire life. And from a German perspective, helped me pre-sell my first 500 copies. That's <laughs> good. Yes, that was my process. We'll get into what's in the book in a second, but we got a live question right here. I'll go to that. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, Matt, thanks for coming. Um, so I've seen some research that suggests that, um, how to put this, like most of each person's happiness level is predetermined by their genetics, and there's only a little bit that we can affect. Do you think that's true? Like, what do you think about that? Yeah, so if I can remember the numbers off the top of my head, I wonder if it was Sonia Lombersky's work. It was, I think it was 50% is genetic, 10% is controlled by factors outside of your control, like the weather, the stocks, etc. And they say 40% is completely within your control. So 40% is a lot. That's the difference between a D minus and an A plus in happiness. <laughs> so the challenge is, 
as it goes with a lot of happiness research, happiness is very subjective. It's, it's difficult to measure happiness in objective terms. You can't really quantify exactly how happy philanthropy will make you because you can't just show up in a habitat build with an MRI machine. You just throw people in it and measure the difference. That being said, what they have measured are the longitudinal effects of meditation, and I think more subjectively, the self-reported effects of philanthropy, et cetera. So to expand on your question, do I believe in the 50, 40, 10 rule? Do I believe in um, some of this more subjective or open-ended happiness research? I can't find any counter evidence to it. I haven't really found work by um, Chen Ming Tan or Sean Aker or Sonia Lubersky that I disagree with. I've found subjective evidence in my own life. Thanks. Thank you. We got another live question. Sure. Hi. Thanks again for being here. Um, I think this topic is definitely super relevant. We've all probably seen at least the headline of the BuzzFeed Millennial Burnout article and things like that. So I was wondering, from your perspective, what is unique to being a millennial that makes this question like hard to answer? Or what about being a millennial applies this question? And on the flip side, like how does being a millennial inform what the solution looks like also? Thank you for asking that. It's funny, the number one feedback I get on the book is, it's great, why is millennial in the title? One of my family friends, their daughter read the book, and then when she went off to college, she couldn't find her copy of the book. That was because her mother had stolen it and hidden it in her room because she wanted to read it. And anyone over 35 will read the book and ask me the same question, why are you orienting this just to millennials? And to be honest, I don't really have a good answer. I've actually been thinking about retitling the book to just making happiness, uh, because I do want to appeal to a broader audience. I think this positive psychology, these happiness hacks, this, this knowledge of how our brain works and how to improve our lifestyles applies to every generation. I just wanted to galvanize millennials into taking advantage of it because I feel that we're poised to make the most change in the world right now that we desperately need. Um, I think the challenges that millennials the challenges specific to the millennial audience that we grew up with, I'm 28, is social media, I think, has made the most impact. I think social media was originally conceived, business objectives aside, to bring us together as a society, right? So if you can catalyze the way that people communicate and make events, that should be great for humankind, right? But I think what we've done is use that not as a supplement or a catalyst of social behavior, but as a sub as a replacement, right? So why would I call up a friend if I could just Facebook chat him? Why would I, um, why would I try to connect with this person again over coffee if I could just connect with them on Facebook, add a friend, whatever? Um, so I think. What also goes with that is a phenomenon they call impression management, right? So as a species, we've, we've evolved. We are the offspring of the smartest, most powerful among our species. And the way that we've shown that off in the past is by what they call peacocking, right? So making ourselves look smart, intelligent, impressive to the small audience that's around us. What Facebook, Instagram, and social media sites have given us is a microphone. That instead of peacocking to just five people that we might care about, we're now trying to peacock to 1,500 people on a daily basis. That's a staggering amount of pressure to put on ourselves. I remember back in college, I had two friends, Ann and Dave. They were that couple that dated throughout college. And one thought, oh, they're the perfect couple. We need to be like Ann and Dave. Well, I knew Ann and Dave better. <laughs> yeah. I knew. Um, and these are not their real names, but they know who they are. <laughs> so one night, Dave, I was talking to Ann, and Dave came in, and he demanded to know who she was on the phone with earlier that day. Who, who does that? Like, who were you on a phone call with earlier today? She's like, none of your business. He's a jealous type. He's holding a pizza. He takes a pizza out, and he throws it against the wall. Like, this is not a perfect couple. 
And yet everyone thinks they are because they post beautiful pictures on Facebook all the time. How many couples are out there judging themselves against the couples that are on Facebook that look perfect? And everyone looks perfect and they're like, they're taking beautiful pictures in front of the Eiffel Tower and her leg is popping. <laughs> <laughs> that's just not real life. So I think the fact, I think because millennials spend so much time in this arena that's not reflective of the humdrumness and the challenges of real life, we have higher expectations for each of ourselves. And it's okay to remind ourselves that we're all just human. And the best reminder that we're all human is to spend time with other humans. We've got a lot of questions. <clears throat> Uh, hey, thanks so much for coming today. Um, one question I just had was, how do you balance gratitude and ambition? So kind of the idea to be grateful for what you have, and also this, at the same time, you know, from a young millennial perspective, the desire to want more. Sure, yeah, so how do you balance gratitude and ambition? How are you grateful for what you have without stifling your ambition? Everyone in this room is incredibly ambitious. I think, I wouldn't see them as dichotomous. I would see them as, uh, supplementary to each other. So the really important thing to remind ourselves about happiness is that it's a high performance fuel. So a grand fallacy in the idea of I'll be happy when is if we wait for all that happiness to come at the end of this goalpost, that's a lot of high performance fuel that we're not getting that we need to reach that goal. So if you spend your night journaling and reminding yourself what you're already happy for, I don't think, I can't imagine a scenario where that could possibly stifle innovation, or ambition, at least in my own life. It reminds you how far you've come, and reminds you how far you have yet to go. So I'm grateful for what I already have, and that gratitude is motivating me to continue to get more. And maybe I can make a difference in other people's lives to make them grateful as well. Chris, anything else that you want to add before we uh, we wrap up here? Any other happiness tips for the Googlers watching um, here now? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm probably the least intelligent person in this room. So I would love to know, because Google is known as one of the happiest campuses in the world. I'm curious to know, what do you find either makes you happy at work, or what are your personal secrets for happiness, or what are Google's what does Google do to make you guys happy? I'm just curious to know myself. <clears throat> Anyone in the audience want to jump in? Could we pass my mic? Uh, in my personal opinion, uh, working hour flexibility. Like, mm -hmm. It takes off a lot of pressure. And, like, you have something that comes up, we're just going to get back. No one like, watching. So um, I used to work for IBM for 15 years before joining Google, and uh, one of the striking differences that personally made the most the biggest impression on me and probably influences my happiness here more than anything is the feeling of empowerment to change, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that actually drives a lot of the ultimately down the line a lot of the perks that people talk about. Uh, when they mention Google, but that, all of that, I feel, comes from being a part to change, to improve. Um, one thing that makes a big difference for me is this concept of psychological safety that we have. Uh, are you familiar with that? Well, tell me about it. Um, I'm not probably the best person to explain it, but um, Google did a study before I started years ago about like what makes effective teams at Google, what makes them the most effective. And the big thing they found was that um, the teams have a culture of psychological safety, meaning that people feel comfortable giving suggestions without fear that someone's going to like make fun of them, or like everyone is just comfortable being open and being themselves. Um, and that makes a big difference for me. Um, off topic, but you forgot to talk about the, the P in grip, and I was curious about that. Yeah, the P in grip, yeah, passion, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, very, thank you for calling me out. <laughs> hey, um, for some, a lifelong challenge is, how do you answer the question, what are my passions? And what I've found works is simply a brute force approach. Try everything, sample everything. I think finding your passions is like finding metal on the beach. 
You just have to wave it around until you hear a beep. Um, my friend Mark, for example, Mark thought he wanted to teach English. He thought that he'd be passionate about that. So he went to go teach English. He realized to, I think he was teaching to freshmen in high school. And he didn't like it. He liked some things about it, but not <coughs> things. So what he did is he sat down and he wrote out <clears throat> what he likes and what he didn't like. I like teaching, I don't like ninth graders. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't like English. But he heard a beep in his metal detector, right? So he thought, okay, I'm gonna try teaching math to ninth graders. And the school allowed that change. It's like, oh, I love teaching in math. I still don't like ninth graders. <laughs> so now he teaches math to fifth graders. So I think to go out on a limb and just try and sample as many things here and around the world as you can, whether it's belly dancing or hula hooping or coding, whatever it is, trying it, and then being mindful of that beat. I think I kind of like this. And then tweaking it from there is how you find your passions. And passions, to me, are things, activities that we fall in love with, just like we fall in love with a spouse or a member of our family. So passions is just another form of love. And as uh, T told us, it's one of the two secrets to happiness. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Yeah. We got a lot of question here. <clears throat> Hi. So uh, you were talking about uh, happy, and I feel like one of the things that came to mind for me was that uh, I know, you know, when we think about happy, I think um, a lot of people are, you know, their religion makes them happy. But I also feel like there's a there's a subsect that their religion makes them very unhappy. So just curious, kind of what what you think? I don't know. Just in your travels, what you've um, experienced in terms of religion and how that relates to people's happiness. And secondly, since we were talking about ambition, what is you know your end goal? What are you looking to do? What would you love to do in the next 10, 15 years for accomplish? Thank you for asking that. So first question. Um, first question is um, religion. Sorry. Reli yes, the religion question. Thank you. So. When religion makes you happy, there's a metric on the UN World Happiness Report, which is a report the UN puts out for free every year, I think since 2014, that measures and ranks every country's happiness. How do they measure that? They send out surveys to each country that have six metrics on them, and the people respond and they measure happiness based on that. One of the questions pertains to social belonging. And it's the simplest question on the entire survey. And the question is, do you feel that when times, when times get tough, do you have one person in your life to count on? And it's sad because a lot of people answer no to that question. And I think organized religion is, for a lot of people, that place, a place full of people that they can count on. It can also be a place for meditation and prayer a place for introspection and for gratitude. I think that's when religion can make you happy. I think when religion can make you unhappy is if it stifles natural sources of happiness, if it stifles ambition, if it says you can't do this, you can't do that. If it's, if it's a, a microphone for um, oppression or, or um, judgment, I think that's when religion can make you unhappy. That's, that's about as politically correct a response I can give to that question. <laughs> I think um, the second question regarding ambition. Um, my ambition. My ambition is to visit every country in the world and continue studying happiness. I want to understand and try to help in countries where happiness isn't a priority or is such a distant thought that it takes a distant priority to survival. So I think even for people in desperate situations, there are ways that they can increase their happiness, which in turn creates uh, can improve their survivability. Uh, so that's part of my ambition, travel the world, <clears throat> continue traveling the world, uh, continue writing. I have a second book in the works with an e-learning on top of it called Mesh. It's based on my Mesh platform, meditation, exercise, sleep, and hydration. It's going to be called Mesh, How to Take Better Care of Your Brain. And continue writing and helping people in any way that I find I can do that most efficiently. Most efficiently, 
<laughs> over the next, as long as I can speak, you know, the next 50 years, uh, any way I can find to help me. Chris, how can we follow your journey? Sure, so I just got an Instagram. <laughs> I, I created it in the airport on the way here, I'm not joking. <laughs> so if you want to be my 27th follower, <laughs> that'd be so cool, that's my Instagram handle. I promise to post on it. That's my site, and otherwise, if you'd like a copy of the book, we're selling them in the back corner. See Andrew back there, I'll also be back there signing books. And just be grateful. Just pass along anything that you found valuable today. Just pass it along to your friends, family, and people you find in your life that need a little bit of happiness. If I may, if we have time for one more question. Uh, this would help me to help other people. What, what did you guys find valuable in today's talk? What's your number one takeaway? I, I think the frameworks in particular are really helpful. It might just be like the nature of most Googlers and our OCDness, but usually um, I think those frameworks are are really helpful. They're easy to follow and very catchy. So those are my main takeaways. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris, for coming. Um, let's give a, a big round of applause for Chris. Thank you.